if you ask me a question, I'm never gonna say, I believe that. I'm gonna be like, it's possible. It's likely. Are you the hardest person to date? <laughs> no, you know, it's actually like, I, I'm, I'm really fine. I'm just the hardest person to be a friends with. Welcome to The Good, The Bad, and The Science, the show that breaks down the science of television and movies with a comedian and a scientist. Today, we're discussing Loki. So I'll ask about the multiverse, free will, and if my guests are real or just variant versions of themselves. Hi, everyone. I'm your host, Ethan Edinburgh, and I've got two wonderful guests joining me today. I'm thrilled about it. Our first guest is a science communicator with 8 million followers, and he is the host of a Netflix show called Netflix IRL, where he debunks facts from Netflix originals. Welcome to the show, Dominic Andre. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here, good sir, all the way from Northridge. Uh, yeah, well, thank you so much for having me. I'm honestly super, super pumped. Um, this is like, Loki was first off, I mean, just my favorite, favorite show on earth. And science, obviously, a huge passion of mine. So Sweet. anytime I can debunk stuff, talk about stuff in the movies, because uh, movies really kind of dictate how people perceive science. So this is a really cool topic. Absolutely. A thousand percent agree with you. And it just so happens that last week we did a whole episode on Squid Game. And I saw that you recently did a segment on Netflix IRL about the tug of war tactics used on that show. Can you tell me what you found? Yeah, so that that actually works. Basically, everything, all those tactics in the show really do work. And we got to be able to test out, you know, having two teams. And I definitely know that our team was a little bit stronger. We had a, a, you know, kind of a bunch of bigger people that kind of weighed more. And so I was fully expecting us to kind of dominate. And so what, how we did it is we used the tactics. The other team just had to use like normal tactics that normal people would use. And then we switched. And I was fully expecting like, okay, it might be a little bit tough when they all lean back and they all kind of do the little like tug and pull. And the second they all leaned back, it, it felt like just the weight just stopped. Like no matter how hard we all pulled, it did not work. And they probably weighed definitely a couple, like maybe 100, 200 pounds less than us. And I could not pull them for the life of me. And I was thoroughly impressed like some of them made sense like kind of putting it under your arm right that's just more friction more more muscle attached to it but the leaning back really threw me off because it was it was very interesting to feel as they pulled it just felt like I was pulling a wall so it, it, it does work and honestly I'm very very uh excited to like show people that yeah absolutely that's fascinating I'm, I'm glad that it actually works and uh and now if you're listening and you're in a tug of war battle to the death uh, you can know to implement that uh, that tactic. That's really cool. Um, I also saw a video, I have to mention this, where you were eating the world's most expensive chocolate. And I believe your review was, it's good, but I don't really like dark chocolate. So I really respected your honesty on that video uh, because I was curious if that chocolate was any different. I, I got hate. I got so much hate. People are like, why would you eat that if you don't like dark chocolate? I'm like, well, why wouldn't I try it? What if I did yeah. like it? Like, and everyone was livid. They were like, you <laughs> disgust me. You don't like dark chocolate. And you just, you just spent, it was like $500 for like these pieces. And they were so angry at me. The thing is, it was just very bitter. Like, mm -hmm. I get it. Dark chocolate supposed to be a little right. bitter. It was like I was eating tree bark. And you know what I mean? And it, it was just not the same. It's the equivalent of like anything that isn't like, you know, thrown in with extra ingredients. It's basically just as rocking it. Was the bitter flavor from the chocolate, though? Great question. Or the regret of spending $500 it, on it, chocolate? It almost felt like someone had left regular dark chocolate out for a month, and then I ate it. It was like fermented in my head. That's what it felt like. That might be what they did. Have yeah, you ever gone true. to fancy restaurants? They're like, there's this old apple <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Found. Like, I feel like it's exactly like all of that. <laughs> um, well, I loved it. I don't know if that outbalances the hate, but... <laughs> Um, okay, well, uh, chiming in with uh, already great questions, which you can expect all episode long, is my second guest. He is a writer and science communicator for our lovely overlords at Seeker. And if you're a gamer, you might know him from his work on, and I think I mispronounced this last time, NVIDIA GeForce. NVIDIA. Nvi it's like the Spanish Nvidia. word for envy, which is why their logo is a green eye. Okay, very now good. You know. Good to know. Now That's you know. him. That's yeah. my old pal, Julian Huguet. What's up, Jules? Hey, Ethan. Good to be back. I'm stoked to talk about Loki. I have many questions as well. 
Great. Awesome. And uh, has anyone also like called you Jules already? Or am I insulting your parents' uh, decision by doing all, that? All the time. All the time. Uh, I hate it. It's oh, great. my least favorite nickname. You may call me that, though, because I respect you so much. Just you. <laughs> wow. Not Dominic. If Dominic tries it, I'm walking. Is there one you like more? Me? Uh, Julian or Jules? I mean, it's all fine so long as you say Lord in front of it. That's the only okay. caveat. I'll try and do it really fast and soft. I'll do like a Lord Jules. Yeah, there you go. Um, and I got to ask before we get into all things Loki, since you are such a gamer boy, A, have you played Cl uh, Cuphead, which I know is like four years old at this point, but I just got into it, just started playing Cuphead, love it. And saw that there's a Netflix show they just dropped a trailer for, uh, for an for a animated show about Cuphead. Cuphead is so good. I remember when Studio Moldenauer showed their trailer and everybody was like, an animated like platformer boss fight game that's a, like crazy hard, but that weird 30s animation style, not like yes. cute like Looney Tunes, like bizarre what fever dream did the cartoonist have when making this? So right. good absolutely great game yeah i i'm only about probably a third or so into the game but i'm also just every level is so exciting to see the animation to see what the boss is going to look like what they can we know how they're going to fight um so anyway i just I, I thought about you today because i was like oh my god i can't believe now they're making a show of it this thing uh it totally deserves it it does it's exciting thank you ethan i think about you every day <laughs> I guess that's a compliment. It seems really weird. I'm going to just leave it. I'm going to leave it. I'm going to let it lay. Um, okay, so let's get your thoughts on Loki, guys, because I think I'm in Dominic's camp. I was kind of stunned by this show. Um, I, if you guys haven't seen it, obviously, we're going to spoil stuff. We're talking about all things Loki today. Um, but I absolutely loved it. I thought it was incredible. And I watched it after I watched WandaVision. And I also adored WandaVision. So it seems like Marvel's on a roll here with these shows. But uh, but yeah, Dominic, what what did you think of it? What did you think going in? Um, you know, where does it rate on your Marvel show meter? Yeah, I mean, so we all know that like what was him Tom Hiddleston. I, I mean, amazing, amazing actor. And I think like I've heard from everyone. Everyone's reaction is, oh, my God, he's amazing. He's amazing. His acting's just so good. So one thing that I did notice with all the, the Marvel shows that are coming out, I feel like you know, Wanda wasn't a necessarily a main character, so when hers came out, it was kind of like, okay, this was really cool, but it didn't feel as marvel -y. It kind of felt like, you know, when those mm. movies come out, they make an offshoot of, you know, a side character. But when, when Loki came out, I was like, oh my gosh, this is like the, the Marvel, right? This is the main timeline, if anything, we're talking. And I'm following like the most important part, although WandaVision was absolutely amazing, but I felt like Loki was so much more tied to Marvel, to, to Avengers, mm. And I was really, really excited about that because it was very, very intertwined versus kind of uh, Wanda was kind of like, okay, here's just like this offshoot that happened. But Loki felt like this is a continuation of the Avengers. So absolutely amazing. I, 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 I think this is the best show that they've ever done so far. And I think it's going to yeah. rank probably one of their top. But again, Tom Hiddleston, absolutely amazing actor. So uh, I'm pumped. Yeah. And I think this is just there's so much to talk about because this is like making – the end game time travel like 10 times worse because there's so much more that goes on <laughs> yeah they definitely cranked up the science slash science fiction for this show big time uh which i really appreciated but uh, but julian what did you think i mean i enjoyed it so much i there's so many marvel shows that i'll confess i'm not up to date on a hundred percent of them i still haven't seen falcon winter soldier uh, but I, this is definitely probably my top of the uh, Marvel show spinoffs. I do think it's funny, though, because Marvel had to focus on this villainous main character. It's right after the Battle of New York where he's just killed, like, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. And then he has to be, like, the sympathetic main character. So Marvel has to be like, oh, he's, he's just, you know, he's going to regret it. It's all a big misunderstanding here. And now we can have fun with Loki. And I was like, all right, I'm going to set this disbelief aside and just enjoy this. But the um, multiple branching timelines concept is always one I enjoy. And I always like seeing how writers are going to tackle it and deal with the, the consequences that come from it. So it's always a good, like, just grab a bag of popcorn and enjoy yourself ride, regardless of who's in it. And then when you throw me Tom Hiddleston and Owen Wilson, of all people, to be oh, yeah. the, the leads, it's just a great time. 
Yeah, so good. And you're so right, by the way. I've thought about this multiple times watching certain Marvel movies about how these people are murderers. Like some of our hero main characters have killed tons of people before and we're supposed to kind of forgive them and forget about all of that stuff, which uh, I don't know, bothers me randomly. Talking of WandaVision, right? Like it gets to the end of it and like the the spoilers, but you know, this town that she's held captive for how long? Like they've been in mental, horrible prisons, like the worst sort of psychological torture. And at the end, everybody's just supposed to be like, well, you know, she had a hard time. Okay, everybody like (laughs) be nice to Wanda. I'm like, no, I think Wanda's the bad guy here. (laughs) Yeah, I know. I think we should put her in one of those glass prisons actually, because uh, when yeah. she has a bad day, oh, thousands of people suffer for God knows how long. And they had the whole song like, oh, it was Agatha all along. And I'm watching like the recap of what Agatha did. And I'm like, all right, the dog killing was terrible. But then everything else, I don't think Agatha really did that much. I'm pretty sure it's all <laughs> Wanda being the bad guy here. Yeah, it's a skewed perspective for sure. Um, and I also I have to mention, and this is I know not science related, but I think my favorite part of Loki was alligator Loki. Oh, I don't know yes. how you guys felt oh, about that. We're, that we're made me laugh. We're gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk about that. <laughs> oh, he's okay, got good. notes. I got notes. <laughs> I would love to hear any notes on that because that consistently made me laugh. Almost every shot of alligator Loki, I absolutely loved. <laughs> yeah, that, it, it was good. I mean, I bought I bought an NFT of it. I, I was oh, really? Fun. Yeah, I've been collecting like all the Disney and Marvel NFTs and I bought the alligator NFT. I bought it for like, I think 80 bucks and it's now 800. So I'm like, right. this guy Whoa. owns alligator Loki. We are yeah. talking to You're, the this, blockchain certified the, owner <laughs> of alligator yes. Loki. They jipped I me mean, off. They made they made 6000 of them and I, everyone <laughs> has to buy just the same one. But I was uh, like, it's worth it. Hey, still, to me, you are the perfect guest for this podcast. You have an alligator Loki <laughs> NFT. Exactly. I mean, if that's not geekdom, I don't know what is. That <laughs> seems really smart. Um, okay, so the main thing, which we already kind of touched on, is the multiverse, right? I mean, the Marvel multiverse. This has been mentioned in several Marvel movies. I think it's also synonymous with the quantum theory that there's multiple timelines and that we're living in the sacred timeline. Am I... Am I talking? Yeah, Loco. No, it's it's no, it's, it's going to be the confusing. Show's Loki. Yeah. Loki. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, am I talking Loki? Yes, you are. Yes, you you are correct. <laughs> okay, okay, cool, cool, cool. Yeah, it's funny because um, this is one of those. It's a trope of sci-fi, uh, but it's something that is hotly debated among quantum physicists. And the answer, the problem, all comes from. Uh, just the quantum weirdness of the universe and how we interpret it, right? Like, you've probably heard of the Schrodinger's cat thought experiment. You put a cat Mm -hmm. in a box. There's a 50-50 chance that some radioactive particle will decay and trigger something that poisons this cat. So the cat exists in superposition, right? The particle is in superposition because it is both decayed and not decayed until you open the box, and then you'll find out if the cat's alive or dead. But that's what's known as the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, where when you observe something, you have an impact on what happens. Your observation changes the outcome. And it's called an interpretation because we have to figure out, okay, like this seems to be what happens. Why does it happen that way? And what a lot of people landed on was like, well, we observing it, we are we affect the quantum system in some way. But in the 50s or 60s, another, he was a student, I think he was a grad student named Hugh Everett, said, what if our observation isn't what changes the outcome? What if all outcomes happen, all probabilities continue to exist, but they branch off into many different worlds? So this is called Mm -hmm. the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, as opposed to multiverse that can be kind of like a splitting hairs but multiple universes can technically be a different concept but the Mm. many worlds interpretation is every timeline continues onto infinity for every single different quantum outcome that there can be and this is why it's this fodder for science fiction that's so great but also we'd have no way of knowing how do you test it so it's just you know what what side do you want to pick copenhagen interpretation Many worlds interpretation. Did I blow your mind a little bit? 
Uh, you're definitely blowing my mind. I'm wondering if Dominic wants to yeah. retort, call you out, if this is like a yeah, science debate. Listen. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you're lying. No. Uh, <laughs> um, no, I mean, here's the problem. I mean, for people listening, and, and like I said, I, I like to explain things really simply. Qu- quantum theory, and just in, in general, what these uh, physicists are doing are trying to understand things at a subatomic level to basically say, okay, if we understand how things are happening at a subatomic level, then we can understand everything else. It's the foundation for everything. And there's a lot there. I mean, to be honest, there is no one knows, right? Like, you know, Julian said, we, we don't really know. And it's probably going to be a long time before we do know, if any. Um, and the real thing that we have to understand is kind of like, what do we do even if one of those things are true? And how does that affect everything in our reality? And that's what I wanted to talk a little bit about today, which is uh, if, if let's just say we assume that, you know, obviously the Loki timeline, it all comes down to one timeline. It's unified. If that is true, what does that mean? And I think that's a huge thing. You know, uh, when I was doing my first degree in philosophy, uh, everyone was like, oh, philosophy is dead. It's now science. Uh, realistically, science finds the truth. Philosophy tells you what to do with that truth. And and something that I've like, really realized is like, OK, if we find something out like, OK, the timeline, there are multiple timelines, blah, blah, blah then we're going to need to know what to do with that information and how that affects us. And something really important is to understand that um, if it is true that there's multiple timelines and that every kind of everyone's living different lives, uh, is it possible psychologically and is it possible to unify those timelines? And that's what I wanted to kind of dive into. And one, it'd be really cool to bounce back with Julian on this and to uh, blow Ethan's mind because um, realistically, it's not really possible. And Ethan, you mentioned the alligator. And this mm-hmm. is like my favorite thing. They tried to Love make a unified timeline, right? And they don't really explain right. it in depth. Again, you know, spoiler, at the end, they kind of explain it more. Um, but realistically, it is kind of impossible to have a unified timeline if there are different variations of people. Because if I'm mm. an alligator, I'm not going to live the same life as this version of me because I have thumbs and hands and let's just say realistically uh or in this timeline i slip and i cut my thumb on something that can't happen to the alligator version and if i cut my thumb off my life is going to be drastically changed on the way i live my life the way i do things and little by little kind of like if you if you're off by a degree in space eventually it becomes millions and billions of miles and that's the same thing with the butterfly effect and 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 the timeline is that even just a small cut on my hand you cutting off my thumb that will lead to such a variation in my life. And so it's almost impossible to have multiple hundreds, if not thousands, you know, infinity amount of timelines and then unify them to be going the same way. Um, Because like they said, like, oh, I I think one of them said like uh, um, one of the Lokis mentioned that he killed his mom. Right. And, And that was like, oh, that was my Nexus event. Well, something led that Loki to do that. And it would have led all of the other Lokis to do that. And that's something that I really wanted to talk about today, which is basically free will. How much do we have? And something that I think is really cool. And, you know, Julian talked about this, about Agatha and and people who's at fault, which is what do you do with that information if there is no free will? And who is at fault? And how do you solve those bad things that are happening? So that's what I wanted to talk about. Sweet. So who's at fault, Julian? Yeah, uh, Agatha is, uh, she killed a dog, so I'm sorry. By the rules of movie and TV, Agatha is the worst officially. How many how many humans per dog is it equal? Uh, infinity. Dogs are better than people. I stand by this forever. Sorry. Is it the same math with cats? A cat is one half of a dog, which is still <laughs> infinity, the way the math works Damn. out. And still infinity, people. So, yes. <laughs> okay, I guess I'll take it. It still seems somewhat offensive, but I'll take it. <laughs> Well, my dog listens to this podcast. I have to make sure that she, you know, I don't insult her. No, of course. And hey, thank you to Julian's dog for listening. <laughs> well, if, yeah, if you want me to dive in, I'll dive into the free will part. You ready? Let's do it. Yeah, I mean, listen, for me personally, I hope that we have free will. I don't yeah. like the idea that I'm not making the choice to talk to you guys today or the choice to sip my espresso, that it's up to somebody else is uh, terrifying to me. So, you, what, well, both of you, real quick, what is your belief on free will? If you can give me like a one sentence thing on it. I haven't made up my mind yet. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> That's pretty good. I don't know. That's a good answer. <laughs> That's a good answer. That's a good withholding. You know, I, I tell everyone they get really annoyed with me, but they tell me like, well, what do you believe? And I go, well, I don't have any beliefs. They're like, what do you mean you don't have any beliefs? I'm like, why would I believe in anything? I go off. Is it true? Not true. Likely, not likely. Plausible, not sure. plausible. So if you ask me a question, I'm never going to say, I believe that. I'm going to be like, it's possible. 
It's likely. Are you the hardest person to date? <laughs> no, you know it's actually like I, I'm. I'm really fine. I'm just the hardest person to be friends with because uh-huh. I will correct everyone. And everyone's like, can you not do that? I'm like, I'm sorry. I just, I can't continue this conversation unless we're all factual. You leave a, you leave a movie date with Dominic and you go, oh, what'd you think of that movie? And he's like, well, it definitely was made. It was it, uh, <laughs> starting from the it factual was filmed. beginning. <laughs> from the factual it, beginning. It was screened. I ate 740 calories of popcorn and now we are uh, departing on our way home. <laughs> the only thing oh, you can Jesus have opinions Christ. on are just emotions and, and, and interpersonal relationships. Everything else you can't really have an opinion on. You need to you just either be like what is what is likely, what is not likely. But but yeah, okay. So this is like my favorite topic. I, I literally worked on a master's in clinical psychology and a, ma- and a master's in politics. But um, one of the ones that I focused on that I really liked was my philosophy and, and religion uh, degree. And for that thesis I wrote on free will. And that was more um, – Philosophical, meaning it's just kind of like what we thought in our head, basically using our mind. And then when I started to step into the clinical psychology realm, it was much more factual based. What, what you know, what are evidences that can show that maybe free will doesn't exist or its limitations? And um, I started to write about it a lot. And realistically, I'm going to short answer. There really isn't any free will. There could be some, but pretty much there isn't any. And I'm going to explain why. And it's really, really cool, actually. Um, depressing, but... <laughs> I, I worked as a therapist, and, and I was able to kind of turn that that actual fact into something very positive, right. and I'll explain. This okay. seems like a roller coaster so we're about to we'll go So we'll dive on. into this, and we can dive into like how that relates to Loki. Awesome. Oh, yeah. This is my favorite topic. And now that I don't have to annoy my girlfriend with this topic, I get to annoy you two. So, <laughs> Thank you, Dominic's um, ex. Basically, when it comes to free will, <laughs> we are We are computers. <laughs> we, we, are, uh, we are computers, right? And... Um, Julia, I'll just like use you as a back and forth, but like if if I tell a computer to solve this problem and it's never done it before, it's going to what is it's just gonna do something random, obviously, right? We don't know what it would do. Uh maybe crash. But ultimately if it does that, it's gonna keep doing that exact same thing every time, right? If if you start your computer and it starts up with a let's just say with a blue screen, it's gonna do that every time unless you do something differently. And The same goes for our brains, right? Uh, Every decision we make, if I teach that computer to solve that problem, every time it's faced with that problem, it will solve that problem. If I teach it that if that problem arises to, um, to break down, it will break down. And so basically we are computers and the information that gets input into our minds is used to make decisions thus for thus forth. And so it's basically uh, event after event. And so I always tell people as an example, um, if I point a gun, I'll, I'll, I'm going to ask you both this. Uh, so Ethan first, if I point a gun to you, you're at the ATM and I say, give me th- your money or I will kill you. Do you have free will? In- uh, yeah. I mean, you know, I could roundhouse kick your ass. Obviously one choice, so- uh, or give you the little money that I have. And I probably do the, the, the latter. Yeah. And uh, what about you, Julian? What do you think? If gun to your head, hey, you give me your money or, or you die, these are the only two choices, the outcomes. Do you have free will in that scenario? No, you can have all $20 in my bank account. And, and here, here's why, right? We Both of you said you would give the money up. And why? Because we are programmed to survive. Yeah. Right? If we were programmed not to survive, you'd be like, end me. Right? And so from that point, that fundamental foundation of like, okay, survival, you're going to start making all these decisions, right? Yeah. And so we have the fight or flight instinct. We've got genetics and all of these things, right? Nature versus nurture, biggest debate, right? Uh, something I've studied for all, like a decade now is that there is not one or, or the other. They are both working together. And depending on a specific topic or thing that you're talking about, one can overtake the other depending specifically on you. So, for example, let's just say being smart. You can genetically be predisposed to be a genius, but if you were born to a family that suppressed that, you know, education's stupid, don't go to school, you need to just work in this village or you need to go work on the farm, you're going to have a very limited mindset and your brain is not going to reach its, its potential. And so your parents' upbringing, that environmental factor, can overtake your genetic factor. But sometimes your genetics can be so to, let's just say, the right, which is like you're so smart – that there are people like in tribes in Africa that are like literally learning how to create electricity from nothing. Like they're creating solar panels. And these are kids that are just geniuses. And so sometimes your genetics can overtake the environment and sometimes your environment can suppress the genetics. Sure. Um, for example, uh, as you probably would have guessed, I'm not an athlete. <laughs> and 
I took a DNA test from 23andMe, Ooh. and it literally tells me in there, you do not possess <laughs> the genetics that almost 99% of all athletes do. Ouch. I was like, thank you. That's an insult, but I appreciate it. Can you bring that to like a gym teacher when they're like, I, you got to run I a mile, and you're like, sorry, <laughs> genetics. I did the test. I, I did Can't. the test. <laughs> and it's true. So so it's it said on the study that like nine, almost all, almost all athletes in the Olympics have this genetic. Now, it only makes about a 2 to 3% difference on time, wow. weightlifting. But when it comes to qualifying for the Olympics, that's huge. And so when they did this test, literally almost all of them have it. And so if I was born with those genetics and I was born to a family that happened to like sports, I'm going to most likely end up in that path of being in sports. And because of my genetics, I most likely would end up playing in the Olympics or let's just say the NFL or the NBA. And so realistically, we get put in these positions of environment. And for 18 years, we don't really have free will. Like we would, we would both admit, all of us would admit here that a baby doesn't really have free will. It's not consciously making any decisions. Yeah. Stupid baby. Yeah, babies are schmucks. Yeah, it's going to use that information to make a decision. And so um, there was a, a psychological experiment, uh, very unethical, but they exposed a child to a cotton ball. And every time they'd show them the cotton ball, they would honk like the, the big air horn, scare the hell out of the baby. And it got to the point where the baby would see like a bunny. And since it was kind of similar in look, it would just start freaking out. And so it learns something at such a young age and it Whoa. applies it over time. And eventually like, you know, it, it could have to need therapy later on in life because of those issues. So every decision you make today, tomorrow, and the next day was based off the hundreds of thousands of events that have happened to you in the past. So, for example, when I asked people that gun question, some of them were like, well, I would just turn around, I'd punch them. I'm like, wait, why would you do that? Like, oh, well, I was trained in, in martial arts. I'm like, okay, why were you trained in martial arts? Well, my dad at a young age put me in martial arts. I'm like, oh, well, why did he do that? Well, his dad, you know, got in a fight one day and that led him. So it's always an event that leads someone to make a decision. No one just randomly makes a decision for no reason ever. Hmm. You know, the, the way you look, the way you the way you feel, every single thing applies to how you're going to move forward. And that is ultimately why we don't really have that free will, because we aren't affecting our environment and we cannot affect our genetics. And those are the two things that determine who we are and the decisions we make. And those environmental factors, you know, lead people to do things. I mean, you've heard every single billionaire, millionaire athlete tell you some sob story or some thing that led them to become a millionaire. That event, if it didn't happen would most likely have led to them not being where they are. Meaning they did not do anything. That event was the cause of all of it. And that applies to pretty much every single thing we do in life. And that is in short why we, it's not even short, but in short right. why we don't really have that free will. And I'd love to ask answer questions. Yeah, I've got a question for you. So you have the scenario where you're, you know, mugging me at an ATM and I'm, I'm handing over my meager life savings in order to live because that's my, my driving uh, my guiding star is not dying. Uh, let's say the decision, though, wasn't based on, uh, you know, you, you die if you don't hand over this money. What if the decision is based on something random? You come up to me and you say, I have a quarter. I'm going to flip it, heads or tails. You choose which, and if you're wrong, you die. I have to make the decision between heads or... Uh, no country for old men yeah. scenario. Now, I have to make the decision between heads or tails. I, it's not like my father, you know, put me in a class to guess coin flips correctly as a child or, like, I'm, I'm genetically predisposed to pick one or the other, right? As far as I know, there's no gene doing that. So what's your answer there in my choice when I pick heads or tails? Because it's literally a 50-50 chance which one I pick. Is it determinist, deterministic which one I'm going to say? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, put that in your pipe and smoke it. <laughs> well, that's a great question. And scientists actually <laughs> did this. They actually had people, um, they gave them two buttons and they called them A or B. And they said, hey, at, at any point, when you think which one you want to click, immediately click it. Before they even thought about it, the scientists were able to see with a, with a certain level of accuracy, because, you know, instruments here, we're trying to improve them. They were able to tell which one a statistically higher chance that they were going to pick before they knew they were going to pick it. And that's because your subconscious is making that decision and you don't have control over that, right? And for example, I would bet that if we were to go to every human and ask them, like if we were somehow be able to look in the, in the past and see how many times they've had said heads or tails, especially if there was some sort of event that happened, there could have been this diver diverting path where they pick heads more often. 
and they pick tails more often. And that is true because from a, like a, a, a neuroscience level, there are certain things that make you want to say certain things. You don't know that. Right. If you've played rock, paper, scissors, I guarantee you there's certain ones that you've done far more often than other ones for the first try. And, and I know that I pick usually uh, I've noticed I pick rock and scissors a lot more first try. And it's something that happened when I was younger and I noticed that I would start to do it. And Good it's just know. something. And so one, yeah, you are going to pick something potentially that you subconsciously are just going to pick. You don't have control over it. And two, it's not really free will because the coin is now deciding. That is the event that is deciding what's happening and not you. And so in that sense, it's kind of like, well, what happens if the star explodes? Well, yeah, it's not, it's not in my control. That's why we don't want to say, like, ultimately there is zero, zero free will. Potentially you can make choices. But if I threw you in jail and I'm like, well, you, you can't complain. You've got free will. You could choose to pee on the floor or stand there. It's like just because I have choice doesn't mean it's free. The, the, something in philosophy mm. that we debated a lot is how do we really determine free will? If someone's pointing a gun to my head, it's not a free choice. I'm picking the most logical point based on my genetics, which is I'd like to survive. And so the question is, is like how much now this is my favorite part and how you kind of relate it to the world. A gun to your head states, OK, well, I don't want to obviously die, so I'm going to give up my money. And it wasn't my choice. You know, people would say, why would you give up your money? You could have not. It's like, what are you talking about? I would have to give up my money. The other choice is die. Mm -hmm. And and ultimately I tell people, OK, OK, I know that's death, but let's take it back a bit. What if I said, if you don't give me your money, I know where you live and I will I will harass you the rest of your life. You're going to be like, I I'm going to give you the money. It's 100 bucks, 200 bucks, right? So ultimately, again, a, a threat of just mental harm, no physical, is now causing you to do something you don't want to do. Meaning mm -hmm. now we'll relate that to society. Hey, Ethan, if you get that car, all your friends are going to make fun of you. That's now that mental harm where you're like, now I'm choosing not to get that car. And that's happened to me when I was growing up. All my friends would be like, I would be like, oh, my God, isn't that car sick? They're like, oh, my God, it's so ugly. And I'm like, oh, I know, right? It's so, such a ugly car. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I don't want to get that car now because I'm pressured by society and my friends yeah. that like, oh, like, I, that's a stupid car. Maybe I, I'm not seeing it or I don't want to be made fun of. And so that is happening to all of us at every decision we make in life. We're thinking about all the consequences that would happen. But imagine you were in a bubble, right? There was no consequences for any decision you'd make. You would make completely different decisions. And so if I change your environment, I can change everything about you. And if I can do that, then it means you're not making any free decisions. Your environment is just shaping you kind of like a computer. We shape that computer to do something. So you're saying that because I care too much what people think, and I, that's why I ended up in a brown Kia Forte. <laughs> Uh, you well, got a key well, okay, forte. Let's, actually, I want I want to I want to break that down. Oh, no. This is perfect. Why why did you pick that? I don't know. I uh, I really don't know. I mean, this is the perfect example of no free will. The car just well, I was magnetized to the car. Uh, I just thought it was a good, affordable, reliable. Okay, affordable car. Right? First word, affordable. That right there, yep. like shrinks down your ability to pick. Right, you're like, hey, there's sure. uh, you know. 500 different cars well let's shrink it down to affordability yep. and then it's like okay well then why are you making more and then you break that down and then it leads to these well you know i didn't get this job or i got fired or i got hurt i got injured or you know i, I like this job my this is the only thing i really do like to do and that's all in, in environmental right like that's all mm. genetic and environmental so you, that's a perfect example where someone says like oh but I, I did this and i freely chose and you track it down to this like i love deep this decision so, Dominic, for my parents that might be listening, can you just say that again as it relates to me? Like, the reason I'm not making more money is because of the <laughs> environment. It had nothing to do with me. I, it was, I did everything that I possibly could. I, this, this is a great, great example. Thank it, you. It, it is true, right? It is really true. People tell me, and I, and I hate this argument, but they say, well, I work hard. That's why I make money. I said, great. Uh, my, my parents own a construction company. One, uh, many of those workers work 18 hour days, 12 hour days, whatever it might be. We don't do this, but let's just say they did. Are they, and many people do, we know that there are tons of workers out there, laborers working that. Are, are they not working hard? The idea of working hard leads to you being successful financially is like saying breathing led me to be a millionaire. It's just like the basic thing you need to do. But realistically, I don't work hard at all. And I've made millions of dollars. Nothing to do with working hard. It's environmental <laughs> and luck. And that's what I did. I got lucky. That's just what it was. My, my, my parents are very business savvy based on their parents mm. and so on. So my brain, everything business becomes very easy to me. 
and I'm a, I'm an opportunist, right. and I also don't have depression, which many people do. Meaning, I'm not going to have a barrier in my day that's going to stop me from getting some, let's just say, work done, or I don't have any social phobia, so I will walk up to someone and create a deal. And I've done that. I've literally made millions of dollars just this year alone, strictly from connecting with people and socializing. Same, same. So the year's only been twenty days. It's unbelievable. Yeah. And I tell people, I'm like, look, like you, I've made like, how did you get that deal? I'm like, well, I, I made friends with, with the rep. Like, what do you mean you made friends with them? I'm like, well, the second I got their email, I, I got their number. Cause sometimes they have their number there. I texted them. I was nice to them. I, re I, now I'm on the front of their mind. So I'm, I'm subconsciously pushing myself in their mind. And every single deal that came through that company went directly to me. And it was simply because I forced my brain or my, like my, my name into their brain. And they weren't necessarily freely choosing that because I was the one texting them all the time. And I. So you have that. the free will. You're controlling other people's free will. Well, <laughs> my parents taught me to do that. When, I, when I was a kid, they would push me to be like, oh, go, go talk to those people at that table. And so I became I, very talkative, this very is, social. First of all, I'm thrilled for you. This is very inspiring and, and positive. And I'm thrilled. I don't know, Julian, if you relate to this, but to have such scientific proof that my parents messed up <laughs> is awesome uh, uh, that's all i wanted to hear on this whole show this whole time well, uh, yeah that's, which i that's think true i mean i mean it relates to loki yeah. right as your parents screw you up yeah that's that's the perfect uh comes full circle dom though yeah, i have we... a i have another question though uh another scenario to throw at you because i was almost going to say okay well if we're saying ethan's making his car buying decisions based on these rational factors right like oh it's what i can afford blah 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 yeah. Uh, then that's a limit to free will. And I was almost going to say, well, what if Ethan has poor impulse control, right? And he, he doesn't have the ability to say, like, I can't afford it, and he just buys it. And then I realized that's more an argument against free will. And the counter to that is, <laughs> if you aren't the kind of person with poor impulse control, so you don't have a disorder like ADHD or something like that, where your brain, your frontal cortex, you know, can actually make decisions and rationalize and stuff like that, isn't that more evidence that free will exists because of the fact that there are people out there with poor impulse control that just do whatever comes into their brain. And many, many people do not have that issue and can make choices based on decision, uh, based on information available to them. So, so that would just be the, the computer basically saying, hey, this computer is going to be more chaotic and it's programmed into their genetics to be more chaotic. But that's still programmed. They're not making that decision free will, right? Something it's called hard determinism. The idea that like, um, neurons don't just appear in your brain in a certain order. Neurons and serotonin levels don't just appear, right? They are there at a certain level. And if I put you in any environment, you're going to make those irrational decisions. But those irrational decisions, similar to chaos theory, if you don't know chaos theory, uh, Julian, you probably do. But chaos theory is just a scientific uh, theory that everything may seem sporadic and radical and random. But in reality, there's still an underlying pattern. You know what I mean? Like I, I tell people all the time, we, we may always forget that Thanos' whole family and basically planet died. And people are like, oh my God, he's so, he's so bad. It's like, but do you understand how traumatic that is? Like, it's like if, if someone killed your family and then you went and tried to kill theirs and people are like, wow, he's a psycho. It's like, really? Are you? Or is that like a, a reasonable response for someone to get that angry? Yeah, there are certain people who would do it versus not, but it's a reasonable response. And so... We always work in rationale. That's why we never have bad guys that are like just so crazy that just like there's no explanation. Even the Joker had explanations as to why he was the way he was. Right. And, it's and all about the, the music that's being played. That's what tells you if they're actually evil or not. You have evil <laughs> you music keys. while you see Thanos. It's different. But Wanda's music is she's a hero. Yeah, I mean, did what, you ever feel bad division, for Thanos? What, what division? Uh, no. no, not <laughs> really. Like, no. Like I saw it as like his family died. Like, I, granted, what he was doing is wrong. It doesn't justify it. You know, just like if someone kills your family, killing theirs is not justified. But it's at least understandable. You're like, okay, I get where they're coming from. Meaning they're not making such an irrational decision that you're like, that doesn't even make sense. You're like, it makes sense. I wouldn't do it. it I don't think mm -hmm. it's right. But it, it's not like, oh, yeah, that guy just like murders people for no reason at all. It's never like that. There's always a backstory for a he reason. He could have snapped his fingers and made twice as many resources, though. I've said that for so long. <laughs> I've said that for so long. I was Why like, was murder the answer? <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, he dude. had a choice there, right? Nobody's stopping him from making more stuff. He just went with murdering everybody. Why I, did no one that in the Marvel uh, pantheon say that? That wasn't a note. That, they didn't get not, that note. Nobody brought it up once. <laughs> 
Dominic, though, this I kind of want to bring these two ideas together, though, of the multiverse and free will and ask you then, do you think that everything's predetermined, that we live in a deterministic universe where because you have no free will, if you can see the beginning point, you can logically see the end point of any scenario? Yeah, I mean, uh, for example, let's just say there is one unified timeline. And I was able to see into the future and I saw that Ethan won the lottery in 10 years. Could he change that? And if he could... One, in, in Thanos, in, in the Loki universe, right, he would be pruned. <laughs> He'd be basically go back. So realistically, one, in, in that universe, in that in, in the Loki you know, universe, of, there is no free will because he's literally killing off anyone who doesn't do exactly what they want him to, they want to do. So you can't blame Loki because even when he tries to do something good in probably many of the universes, he gets killed off. He gets taken out and they get reset. So we can't blame any of these people because the person who's really making decisions is the um, – what is it called? The uh, the guy at the end. Yeah, the TVA. And so that's who's really making the decisions specifically in this universe, meaning we can't look at Loki and be like, wow, what a horrible person. There are probably many universes where he tried to be a good person and they're like, nope, bad. You need to be a bad person. And that's something he discovers and that's something he gets upset about. He's like, so I'm just here to just keep doing bad things? And realistically, just like in real life and in mental health, if I was born with severe mental issues, is it my fault? Is it my fault that I have depression? Is it my fault that I'm, I'm poor because I can't get out of bed? No, you wouldn't blame that person. You would be like, I do. That, that's something. <laughs> it's easier for me to just cast blame and say, you know, it's your fault or it's somebody's fault. It's, it's easier. It's neater. It's my fault for buying such a comfy bed. It's so hard to get out of. You know, mm -hmm. you go back in time and I was like, I got to get the comfiest bed. And then today I'm like, I don't need to make a million dollars this year. I'm asleep. I'm <laughs> like, comfortable. <laughs> Dominic's well, like, bed, by the way, atrocious. It's a bed spikes. of nails. He gets <laughs> up immediately. <laughs> but, but like, think of this really cool thought uh, in, in English. If you if you broke your arm, how would you say it, Ethan? If I broke my arm? Yeah. How would you tell someone? I go, uh, hey, I broke my arm. Yeah. Sucks. I broke my arm. In Spanish, you would say my arm broke. So in Rompio English, la, la brasa, right? someone someone would look at you and be like, well, I don't get it. Like in Spanish, if you tried to say it that way, it sounds like you took your arm and you broke it yourself. Right. It's in, in English. It's all blame. I broke the vase versus Spanish. The vase broke. Uh, you know, I, I broke like my arm in Spanish. Uh, you know, your arm broke. And so those little things, nuances, can change how we think. So that's why in certain cultures, you're going to see certain things. Like we in America, like, blame a lot more. It's your fault. It's mm -hmm. free will. It's your decision. If you're not rich, it's your fault. You're lazy. And realistically, it's not like that. Realistically, it's just like the path you were set on. Would Steve Jobs ever invented Apple if he was born in Nebraska? No. Wow. Probably well, would have invented actually... corn, though. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Could have invented but, a machine that peels corn husks. But so 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 my problem with the Loki universe, and this really ties it down, is it's not possible to have an alligator Loki and it live the same life. Because, for example, in our universe, if you're black versus white or Asian, you live a completely different life based on your skin color. We know that. Yeah. So how would an alligator Loki live anywhere near the same life as a as a human Loki? Right? The way they interact with each other would be different because he doesn't even speak English. It literally like roars, right? And so yep. all of those Speaks things gator. would lead to a completely different – it would be impossible to do that. And so that ultimately is why I don't think this is even possible to have them unified. Every one of them would be pruned because none of it would work. And a female Loki would have a completely different life as a male. Uh, Ethan, you would be – if you were born female and lived that, you would be a completely different person. Yeah, much better person. <laughs> Maybe, so, no probably. doubt about it. Oh, for, uh, I, for sure. I'm going to I'm going to jump in here because I want to talk about quantum physics and stuff again and say that, you know, this used to be a question mark of like, is the universe entirely deterministic in that if you could make a incredibly complex equation that somehow took in every single variable of the universe into account, could you plug in, you know, the starting position of anything and come up with the ending position of anything? But the issue that arises, thanks to our study of atoms and quantum mechanics, is that no, you can't because of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which is this idea that you can't actually know the specific like positions, outcomes, anything of atoms, because ultimately to get even weirder, particles are all just waves and wave functions. And it's all just probabilities of what's going to happen. Right. But there's no 100 percent 
guaranteed outcome of any quantum event. And if you scale that up to a macro scale, you could say, well, there's no guaranteed outcome of any macro scale event as a consequence. So sure, alligator Loki, if you were to just cut and paste an alligator into Loki's position, it wouldn't make sense. But what if we get a quantum universe, like a divergence because of atoms mingling, you know, in the primordial stew, where eventually you get alligators inhabiting Asgard that, you know, adopt an alligator frost giant, quote unquote, to be raised as their alligator son and they can all communicate still. Maybe they can't build, you know, the beautiful temples with their little claw hands, but you still get a Norse pantheon that's entirely alligators. Just because of, you know, some some atoms did something a little different a few billion years ago. It's like the um, the I- infinite monkey theorem. Right. Eventually it'll produce Shakespeare on a typewriter. And the the thing about, you know, the many worlds interpretation is it, it gets rid of the problematic question of what counts as an observation in quantum mechanics. Right. Like what if a if a bug is inside the box with the cat. Does the bug see, you know, the cat, the atom decaying and the cat dying or whatever? Um, so many worlds just says like, well, we'll just make a new universe every single time an atom can behave in a different way. And if you think about that, I mean, think about just how many atoms there are, how much stuff there is in the universe that can happen differently. You get literally I, I you brain can't hold the concept of how many universes that would stem from this it would be unfathomable well listen i would love to keep discussing this but my brain cannot hold any more uh information i'm pretty much spent i'm gonna go sleep uh the rest of the day just to balance this out <laughs> but uh you two are both extraordinary wonderful gentlemen for joining me on the show for discussing this stuff with me I hope we can get together and just keep this gloves off debate going, this violent uh, conversation between the two of you uh, going maybe about Doctor Strange. I know there's a new Doctor Strange movie coming out, so maybe we could uh, relate some of this stuff to that. Uh, But if there's anything you guys want to tell people about, uh, Julian, please, you, you have the floor. Uh, Ethan, it's always a pleasure to be on here. Uh, the people listening might know that we are also spooling up a, another science series, Seeker Plus. Uh, it's also going to be on the Seeker Plus YouTube channel where these bad science episodes are going to be hosted. But the podcast version uh, that's about 45 minutes long where we take the three episode YouTube series and put it all into one episode, that's also going to be available if people want to listen to that too. So thanks for having me on and I hope people uh, want to check that out as well. Absolutely. Yes, please do. The Jules. Make sure you write in and call him Jules. Uh, Send him letters and stuff as well. Dominic, something you want to tell people about? Now's your chance. Yeah, thank you guys so much for having me. This is literally my favorite topic, and now my friends don't have to hear me rant for an hour today on it. Um, But I really appreciate it. Uh, I will be I'm launching a podcast called Chaos Theory, where I literally discuss a bunch of random things, but ultimately they all relate somehow. So I really appreciate everyone listening in, and I can't wait to be on this again one day. Absolutely, for sure. I can't wait to be on Chaos Theory. I assume that's an invitation. I accept. (laughs) And uh, yeah, just uh, again, seriously, thank you both for being on. Thank you guys for listening. And we'll see you next time. Bye bye. Thanks for checking out the good, the bad and the science on Seeker Plus. Is there a movie with some bad science you want us to talk about? Let us know in the comments. Or maybe it's good science. Whatever. We'll do it either way. Also, don't forget to like this video and be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on any new episodes.